Today we are going to be reviewing chapter 7. Chapter 7 was random variables. This chapter had a lot in it. It had discrete and continuous random variables and their probability distributions. It had the binomial and, dis and geometric distributions. It had the normal distribution. It had transformations and combinations. So it had a lot, so we're just going to jump right in. Starting with what is a random variable? It's a numeric variable whose variable depends on the outcome of a chance experiment. So let's say that our chance experiment is studying grocery stores, and we want to know how many items do people buy. If I ask everyone who comes out of the grocery store, how many items do you buy, that's my chance experiment. The number of items purchased is a random variable because it does not have one specific value. The value of the variable is going to depend on the person that I ask. The first person that I ask might have bought zero items, the next person might have purchased 20 items. This would be a random variable. Now this would be a discrete example. So a random variable is numeric, so it's either discrete or continuous. Discrete examples are those counting examples, like the number of items purchased. Continuous examples are those that uh, measure something. So I might measure the amount of time that a person spent in the store. This is a numeric variable because it depends on the person that I ask. First, we're going to look at the discrete probability distributions. So these distributions are displayed in three different ways, by a table, a formula, or a graph. Most of the time, you're either going to see a table, like you see here, or you're going to see a graph. Now, a graph would look like a histogram or like a bar chart. It's going to have bars for each of the possibilities and then give their corresponding probabilities. Now, in this case, I think we were looking at the number of girls in a family, possibly. So, X would be, I could have zero girls, I could have one girl, I could have two girls, three girls, or four girls out of a family of four, let's say. And then below that is the probability. So there's a 0 0.0625 probability of having zero girls in a family of four. There's a 0.25 probability have, of having one girl in a probability of four, and et cetera. So I could ask, what's the mean number of girls in a family like this? Or another way to say that is, how many girls would you expect to be in this family? Or in a family of size four. So this would be the formula for the mean. I take x and I multiply it by its probability, and then I sum all of those up. The mean or the expected values over the long run. So if I look at a whole bunch of sa uh, families of size 4, what's the mean number of girls in, the, in these families? Here would be the formula for variance. Now you need to know both of these formulas, but I'm not going to actually ask you to use them. If I ask you to calculate the mean or the expected value or the variance, you're going to show the formula, substitution, and then get the answer from the calculator. Now I do know that we need to review how to do this on the calculator. So as a reminder, you're going to put your x's in list 1 and the probabilities in list 2. You're then going to go to 1 var stats. Now we only have one variable. x is that variable. We then have the probabilities with it. So here's where you have to put L1, L2. So you're telling the calculator my x's are in list 1, my probabilities are in list 2. If you have the newer calculator, I think it probably says something like frequency list, and that's where you put L2. And then this is the outcome that you get. Now you're going to notice that your sample mean is 2. So out of a family of size 4, we would expect there to be 2 girls. And then you notice the standard deviation is 1. This is that one case where I told you that you can use sigma and not s. And it's easy to notice that because s is blank. You can't even use s for standard deviation. So this is the case where you use sigma. Now there are two very famous probability distributions that are discrete, or probability yeah, distributions that are discrete. The first one being binomial. So binomial is looking at the number of successes in a fixed number of trials. So there are four requirements. The main one is that there's a fixed number of trials. So uh, the example that we just did about the number of girls in a family, that was binomial. There are four kids, so four trials. There are two outcomes, success or failure. So in our case, um, our success would be having a girl. So therefore, failure would be having a boy. Our trials are independent. So the the gender of my first child is independent of the gender of the next child. And then the probability of success is constant. So the probability that my first child is a girl is the same as the probability that the next child is a girl, etc. Now there's a formula for this. So the probability of k equals this formula right here. Now n stands for the number of trials. So in my case, four. Four kids. k is the number of successes. So uh, do I have one girl, two girls, three girls? and then pi is the probability of success. So I would use this formula if I wanted to know the probability of having a specific number of girls. Now to explain it, this pi to the k, that accounts for my successes. So my two girls, let's say. 
this 1 minus pi accounts for the boys. So maybe my two boys, so my two girls and my two boys. Now this n choose k, that's how we read this, n choose k, it accounts for the number of ways that that possibility could happen. So if I have two girls and two boys, my two girls could be the first two kids, it could be the last two kids, it could be the middle two, they could be the first and third, etc. That's what that n choose k counts. It counts how many ways can you have two girls. Now the mean is n times pi, and then the standard deviation is the square root of n times pi times 1 minus pi. Now remember that you have to define pi based on what a success is. So I'm counting a success as having a girl, but you could just as well say that the success is having a boy. So that's something that you're going to have to define. Now for this formula, you need to know the formula, but then you're going to find it in the calculator. So in your calculator, if you go to second distribution, you have binome PDF and binome CDF. Now the order is the number of trials, so n, comma, the probability of success, so pi, comma, k, the number of successes. Remember that binome PDF calculates the probability at a specific value, and binome CDF is cumulative. It's at that value or below it. So I would use binome PDF if I wanted to know what is the probability of having exactly two girls. I would use binome CDF if I wanted to know what's the probability of having at most two girls in a four-child family. Now the thing to remember with CDF, first of all, it does less than or equal to only. So if I put in two, it's going to do two, one, and zero. So if I wanted to find the probability of less than three girls, I would have to do less than or equal to two. If I wanted to find the probability of greater than or equal to one, so at least one girl, I would do one minus less than one or one minus zero. So that's binomial distribution. Related to that is, G oh, sorry, one thing I forgot to tell you is these formulas are on the formula sheet for the AP test. This is how the formula sheet for the AP test appears in regards to the binomial distribution. The only difference to notice is that instead of pi, the AP test uses p on their formula sheet. So again, this first formula, you need to be able to write it, but then use your calculator. Now related to the binomial distribution is the geometric distribution. This distribution looks at the number of trials until you hit the first success. Um, these are the same requirements or the same properties as before, with the exception of there's not a fixed number of trials. And that's because you're going until you hit your first success. Now this formula should be pretty intuitive. So this is the probability of my first success being the 10th trial, let's say. So x is the number of trials. And this formula should make sense because pi is your one success, and then the one minus pi means all the rest were failures. So I have failure, 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 until I hit a success. Now the mean is one over pi. These two formulas you need to have memorized because they are not on the AP test. As in other words, they're not going to be provided to you. Now there is a geometric PDF and a geometric CDF on your calculator. They work the same as binomial, except you don't put in n. So for binomial, it's n pi x. For geometric, it's just pi x, and that's because there's not a fixed number of trials. Okay, so next we move on to the probability distribution for the continuous variables. These were always graphs. So the probability is the area under the density curve. So this is where we had to use all those geometry formulas. So I gave you a graph, and then you had to find the area of a trapezoid or a triangle or a rectangle, and that was the probability. Now remember that the area under the curve is always 1, so your probability is going to be less than 1. If you don't remember how we did this, you're going to have to go back to chapter 7 on your own. Um, the other way that you can find the area is by integrating. So if you're in Calc AB or Calc BC and you want to integrate, that's another way to find the area. The mean and the standard deviation for a continuous distribution are going to be given. Um, I will not ask you to find them because they involve calculus. Now, a distinction I want to make between discrete and continuous. Remember that in a discrete distribution, the probability that x is less than 2 is different from the probability that x is less than or equal to 2. So for example, at the beginning, we talked about a discrete example being the number of um, items you purchased in a grocery store. If you purchase less than two items, that's not the same as less than or equal to two items. The left side would be 0 or 1 items. The right side would be 0, 1, or 2 items. Now in a continuous distribution, these are the same. And that's because in a continuous distribution, a probability corresponds to an area. So the area less than 2 is the same as the area less than or equal to 2. 
In a continuous distribution, we never calculate the probability at one specific point. You can't have the area at x equals 2. That doesn't make sense. Okay, so in this chapter also was transformations and combinations. If you remember, a transformation was taking a random variable, x in this case, and transforming it into y by either adding a constant or multiplying by a constant. So I could ask you, what's the, what is the mean of y? So to find the mean of y, you just substitute in the mean of x into the formula. That one's easy. The one that's more difficult is the variance. Now, if you add a constant a, that does not change the spread at all. But if you multiply by constant b, that's going to change the spread of y. So you find the new variance. So you're going to take your constant, so b, and you're going to square it in this case, and then you're going to multiply by the variance of x. That will give you the variance of y. You then take the square root to find the standard deviation of y. Remember that standard deviation is just variance squared. Along with transformations came combinations. Now a combination is when you're taking two variables and you're combining them to make a third variable. So you can either add or subtract the variables. So really here it could be x plus or minus y makes our new variable of h. Now finding the mean of h is easy. You just add the mean of x and add the mean of y. The one that is more difficult is the variance. Now you can't just right away find the variance of h. Instead you have to, or find the standard deviation I mean. You have to find the variance first. So the variance of h is going to be the variance of x add the variance of y. Remember, variance is just standard deviation squared, so it's the sigma squared. So I'm going to add the variance of x, add the variance of y, and that will give me the variance of h. I then can take the square root, which will give me the standard deviation of h. Now, regardless of whether or not you're adding x and y, you're always going to add the variances. So even if it's x minus y, you're still going to be adding the variances. That's because if I'm combining two variables, my spread should always get bigger. It should never get smaller. There's always going to be more variability. Now, this formula only works if x and y are independent. If x and y are not independent, we're not going to be calculating the variance of the standard deviation. Um, these rules come up a lot, but they're not going to be worded as transformations or combinations. You're going to ha have to be able to recognize them. The same thing with bi binomial and geometric cases. Okay, last thing in this chapter was the normal and standard normal distribution. In your calculator, you did normal CDF. You have to give the lower bound, the upper bound, the mean, and the standard deviation. Remember that when the, the lower bound is negative infinity, it's negative 1 times 10 to the 99th. Anytime you have to calculate a probability using the normal distribution, I want you to standardize, which means you, that you convert whatever value you have to a z-score, and then you use normal CDF or use the table. Um, when you standardize, when you convert to a z-score, that's when your mean and your standard deviation become 0 and 1. Your standard normal table only shows lower probabilities. So you need to know how to use the table, but the calculator is often more efficient. You may have to find extreme values. So I may ask you, find the z-score that corresponds to the upper 10%. So as you can see, the upper 10% would mean the probability of being lower than that value is 90%. In the calculator, I would do inverse norm of 0.9. You always have to use the table and inverse norm when looking at lower probabilities. I could ask you for the most extreme 5%. That means 5% is the outside tails, so the upper 2.5% and the lower 2.5%. If I'm looking for the upper value, that means the upper 2.5%, which is going to be the lower 97.5%. So on the table, I can look for 0.975, or I can do inverse norm of 0.975. That will give me the upper bound for the most extreme 5%, and then the negative would be the lower bound. You also have to know how to use the table. So on the table, again, it's only lower probabilities. On the left side, you're going to have a z-score, and the same with the top. So I may ask you, what's the probability that z is thus less than negative 2.94? So I would go to negative 2.9, and go over to 4. So the probability of being less than negative 2.94 is 0 0.0016. If I wanted the probability of being greater than that, I would just subtract that probability from 1. So you can use this table all the time, just sometimes you have to use tricks with the, um, the symmetry of the, of the distribution. Next was 
determining whether or not a distribution is normal. So the first way is to use a normal quantile plot or a normal probability plot. So normal distribution is very helpful, but we have to make sure that if we have a distribution that it's normal before we can start using normal CDF and Z scores and stuff like that. So in a normal quantile plot, you plot the observed value, so X versus the normal score, so the Z score. So I'm going to plot X versus the Z score. And what I want to know is, is my normal quantile plot linear? If it is linear, then that's evidence that the distribution is normal or approximately normal. If the normal quantile plot is not linear, that's evidence that possibly our distribution is not normal. So unlike a residual plot, a residual plot you look for random, a normal plot you look for a straight line. Now, let's say you have a normal quantile plot that's linear. That gives us evidence that our distribution might be normal. We are then going to look at the correlation coefficient. So you're going to calculate R for that normal quantile plot, and you're going to compare it to what's called a critical R value. And the critical R value would be given to you. Critical R value is based on the sample size. So you would look at your critical R value. If your correlation coefficient is less than the critical R value, then you're going to doubt that normality. You're going to think that possibly the distribution is not normal. If R is greater than the critical R value, then that gives you evidence that the distribution, yes, is normal. So here are three different examples of uh, normal quantal plots. In A, this is evidence of a distribution that's skewed. B is a distribution that has heavy tails, and that's because of the curve. And then C is the presence of an outlier. Although most of the points are straight, you have this point right out here that is an outlier. Last thing that was in this chapter was using the normal approximation for discrete distributions. Now, this can be used when you have a large sample size. The way to check for that is that n pi has to be greater than 10, and n 1 minus pi also has to be greater than 10. If that's true, then you have a discrete distribution that you can approximate using a normal distribution. So this might come up in the case of like a binomial or a geometric distribution. You might want to use a normal approximation. In this case, the mean is equal to n times pi, and the variance is n pi 1 minus pi. And once you have the mean and the variance, you then can go on to calculate a z-score. Okay, that was the end of chapter 7. Right now you're going to work on an example on your own. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email or write them down so that you can ask me on Wednesday. Good luck.